Welcome back to the Color Authority. And today I'm going to be talking to Carl Johan Bertilsson, born and raised in Sweden, but he's lived all around the world. Now, Carl originally studied applied linguistics and he ran his own language school in Mexico for 11 years. Then in 1997, he moved back to Sweden and switched to the color language of NCS, becoming responsible for establishing NCS worldwide. Since 1997, again, his full focus has been on to support different industries, as well as the architect and design community and universities with color solutions. His first color trend workshop was with Color Marketing Group in 2007 in Buenos Aires, Argentina. And since then, he has worked continuously with color trends globally, and he's also responsible for the NCS color trends. In 2016, he established his own design company, Mr. Carl, offering design solutions for interior products and branding, where the aesthetics, the function, and meaning of color always has a central function. His clients are mainly based in China, Europe, and Russia. All of this while still consulting indeed for NCS Color as creative director. Welcome to the Color Authority, Carl, or Mr. Carl. How are you today? Fine, thank you very much, Judith. It's a pleasure and an honor and a privilege to join your uh, chat today. Happy to be here. Thank you. I'm glad to to be talking to you. We were just discussing when was the last time that we saw each other. And then we, I think it was indeed a couple of years ago during uh, the Color Marketing Group Broma Zone in Milan. So that's way too long ago. Yeah, I know, I know. Hopefully it will be again soon. But we kept busy, which is good, yes. especially during COVID times, you know. You're but that's that's the moment when you need to make the, the world more beautiful. So it's a perfect moment to talk about color and to work with color. Yeah. So we can make the world beautiful together. Mm. Yeah. And it, it was during COVID that I came up with this podcast. And I just like people, I felt people were also having a little bit of Zoom fatigue. Mm. And, you know, a lot of visual input through indeed computers and cell phones. And we're like, this is the right time to launch something that people can just easily listen to and enjoy. Perfect. Perfect. Very clever. Very clever. My starting point to all of my guests, which I think you probably know in the meantime, is the first question in this episode will be, what is color to you, Carl? Yeah, and that's a very good question. What is color to me? I Yeah, I saw I saw the question I, and I haven't really found a good answer to that. But to be honest, color to me is one of the most important things that exist. And, and the more I think the more I work with color, the more I understand and realize that the connection to color from the more moment we were born, the connection to color has been fundamental in the creation of who we are and, you know, and, and the way we interact with each other and everything. So, I mean, I usually say when I when I give speeches and everything, that color is one of the most important things that exist in our surroundings or in our lives, because it means so much. And I think one of the biggest, maybe misconceptions, we can come back to that, is that when we talk about color, then people visualize we only talk about, you know, the bright reds or the bright greens and the yellows. But, you know, all, you know there are millions of colors, and, and it's the existence of color that is so important uh, in our surroundings. And but we can talk about that more also. But I've talked a lot to, to architects today. I talked to the automotive industry a couple of weeks ago. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when in the automotive industry, they kind of, you know, switch between black, white and gray. It's like the top selling colors. Maybe a beige, but yeah. But it pops. Yeah, but there are colors that pop up, but the beige will never end up in the top selling colors. You know, the tops will always be the grays and the whites and the blacks. It is saving architecture. You know, today, I think I see statistics about 70% of the new buildings being built in Europe today is either gray or white. Oh, sorry. Yeah, gray or white. And it's, and those are colors too. It's, it's one of these things that I also said in my, in my, in my address to the automotive industry is that it's okay. I mean, if you prefer white to black and gray, that's, that's as long as it is a conscious decision that you really like that. You know, my question always has been, you know, it, because when I ask people, the first thing I always ask people is, is color important? And I still haven't found one person on this planet who said, no, color is not important. Yeah. But there is a big, big thing about the fear of choosing color. We didn't used to have that fear. On the contrary, we used to embrace color. We used to, you know, as much as we could. When we had the opportunity, we would use color. Today, there's a lot of fear of color. Yeah. So we avoid colors because we don't understand, or we cannot argue, or we cannot 
defend our color choice and everything. I had this meeting with this one of the biggest architect companies in Sweden where they said that, you know, default in our interior design is white. It is, and it still is. But I think a lot of people are afraid of picking the wrong color and then maybe also being afraid that they'll look like a fool or they've made a big mistake. Mm -hmm. So then white or gray is very safe, right? Exactly, exactly. And then, I mean, that's the thing. And it's okay. You know, it, it's it's okay but it doesn't do anything. It doesn't do the job. And I, it's like I tell everybody, if, I mean, the the responsibility of an architect or designer is to create, of course, functional things, but above all is to create beauty. And because to connect beauty, with society, with to people. Connect, uh, uh, there is so many dimensions and so many levels about this. And the understanding of this is so important. But at the end, I, I mean, I because color design begins with the aesthetics, the beauty, and then we can talk about the meanings and functions and everything. But my, my point is, and, you, and back to your question, what do you call it to me? Color is equals well-being. I mean, it's, if you manage to create a beautiful surrounding, a room, a space, or a product that you can feel the connection to, in, you know, most of it is due to the color that you choose. And when you don't get that feeling, then we have failed. So to me, color creates well-being. And now I want to be philosophical. I just need to be make one <laughs> philosophical statement here. What happens? Think about this. If we create beautiful rooms, spaces surrounding urban areas where people feel comfortable, people are proud of living, what happens? People get happier. They get less hostile, right? They yeah. enjoy things. And what happens when... They, people stop creating problems. So at the end of the day, I mean, if you really want to be philosophical, if we manage to use color correctly, we can create a much more beautiful world, a much more peaceful world, a happier world. It's as simple as that. Is that how you see sometimes differences? Because you're obviously, you, you were born and raised in Sweden. You lived all over the world, but let's say that you're now back in Sweden again. And mm. people do tend to think, or because of the whole concept of, of obviously also Hitler, and there's many concepts about happiness of the Nordics and of, of the people that live in the Nordics. Is that related to also what you just said, to architecture, choosing maybe colors that connect to people? Or is that a whole different philosophical topic? No, but it's a good topic. I mean, it's a good topic. It's an interesting topic. If you, if you look at color research, most of the color research on this planet has been performed in the northern part of this planet. Why? Because we live in a monochromatic world. Right. So a big part of the year is monochromatic, is dark. We don't have color as you do in Italy or in you know, many other countries, but we don't. So the focus here has always been enormous to to have color around us. You know, so you, so you look at the old, you know, the old towns, you know, because only, historically only the people with money could afford color. So and when we could afford color, man, we used color yes. a lot. And it's still, so we have in our cities, we have a lot of discussions. There is a lot of architectural discussion, a lot of protection of the heritage to make sure that we protect the colors because it's, it's, it has so much value to have color when you don't have color naturally, right? So it, it makes a huge difference and big focus on color. I think much more than, you know, because when you have colors around you every day, it's like you take it for granted, here, you don't take it for granted. No. You know, you have this short, intensive period of time, which is an explosion of colors, you know, June, midsummer, boom, yeah. mid-summer and then yeah. everything goes. Go, Everybody goes crazy in, in yeah, Nordics yeah. because they go out and they spend the whole night outside with friends and drinking and eating and just having fun. I mean, exactly. it is nice when it's concentrated like that as well, right? Because it is a very special moment in, in, in your lives when June comes, July comes, right? I always tell people, you at least on a bucket list, you should spend a year in a country like Sweden, in the very, very north of the planet. So you understand when you have seven, eight months of darkness and cold weather, and suddenly the warmth comes, the sunshine begins to, to, to warm, and the explosion of color comes. That feeling, yeah. you know, the typical spring feeling, that explosion of feeling is something extreme. That's what I miss the most. When I don't, when I don't live in Sweden, 
That's yeah. the feeling that I miss because you don't get that. You have to be able to to be to live in the darkness to appreciate the light. You know. Yeah. Oh, that's beautifully said. Yes, and that's that's one of the one of the topics I wanted to discuss with you because you know we go back a few years and I think we met during one of the CMG meetings either in Europe or in the United States. I can't really mm. remember. But then, of course, we kept meeting in Stockholm Design Week where we both often were speakers. In uh, you know on on the stage talking about our colors and what always fascinated me about you is the way you speak. It's not necessarily that you talk about a topic that obviously we both are passionate about, which is color, but how you speak. And I could I could listen to you for hours. And this is something which I think and correct me if I'm wrong. You learned through through your studies because if we go back to your fascinating journey to color. Mm. Your education was a, re- a little bit different, like like mine. I, I studied political science. No idea how go. I ended up here. Exactly. But you you did something <laughs> completely different. Can you talk a little bit about how you got to color, but also where what was your starting off point? Sure, absolutely. It's a long story, but but let let me long story very short. Um, I spent much of my time traveling. My father was a captain, um, flight captain. So we kind of, you know, if he didn't spend traveling, we were, he was stationed in different parts. So one of the things, you know, all my family, we have lived in many countries. And when I was 19 years old, I got tired of, because I spent then high school in Sweden mm-hmm. and I got tired of Sweden. I said, you know, I, if if I would continue studying, I need to do this somewhere else because I need I need a new experience. I need a new kick, you know. So I found this school in Mexico and I went to Mexico to study linguistics with first Spanish and and I graduated in applied linguistics, um, you know, applied linguistics in the learning of a second or foreign language. And I spent 11 years in Mexico, you know, uh, running my language school, uh, teaching people. And, and I think the core of everything, if you coming back to, you know, more philosophical aspect of this is one of the most beautiful things that exists on this planet is that you can convey or you can make people learn things that you know. Yeah. that you can transmit your knowledge to another person. And when you can see that uh, the other person actually grasps what you want to teach, it's because that's what, you know, this is world about. We are born and everything is about learning, you know, and you should never stop learning. And if you can be the one making the other people learn, I mean, it's a huge privilege. That's and I an think immense it's a, feeling. Yeah. It is, and you know how it is. So, so when you stand there and you see that you can you can get this connection and you get people actually to learn things is one of these things, you know, most beautiful things. So I, I spend a lot of, of years uh, teaching languages to adults, uh, you know, executives that needed to, to learn. And then I moved back when Mexico became a little bit unbalanced in 1997, 1996, 97. I moved back to Sweden and I ran into Thomas Hard in those days, the CEO of NCS because he had a summer house on the island I went to live on. Mm-hmm. So we ran into each other and we began talking and he began explaining and I talked to him. I'm, I'm a linguist. I mean, I, I, languages. He, he looked at me and said, yes, I know this because I manage a color language. And I, and I looked at him and said, excuse me, <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah, we have this color language, you know, and we want this to be a standard in the world and everything. Okay, good for you. You know, I didn't, I, to be honest, I didn't understand anything what he said, but we began talking. And by those days, they were looking for the first export manager to establish the NCS color language outside the Nordic countries, basically. And we began talking and he understood that I spoke the different languages and my international experiences. So why not do something? And I, and one of the fascinations about this is coming back to the same thing. I really didn't understand what he was talking about. You know, language of color. Had, you didn't understand it. Yeah. No, I, I had, <laughs> but at the same time, I spent most of my time in countries where color is fundamental. You know, the same. I've seen you blogged about a lot of Mexico. You know, it's it's about color. Color is so important. You know, the expression of color is important. So it's it's a world, and and to me it was yeah. It, it's like I said, it's just there. I mean, and it's important, yes. And one of the reasons I actually took on this challenge was because 
I thought it was so interesting that I found something that I had no idea what he was talking about. It was like completely, completely understandable. So I said, yes, well, let's do this, you know. And then the journey began in 1997 with color and the science of color. Yeah. You study color and it's, as you said, the science of color. You studied in many different forms, but specifically with NCS, you start on a scientific level. It's really oh, like almost the mathematics of understanding color. But then in the last couple of years, you focused a lot also on color trends. How do these two topics influence one another? Or also, do you have a favorite? No, but they connect it. You cannot disconnect yeah. one from the other. Mm -hmm. uh, it's super important because I think one of the most important things to understand about the science of color, the only reason that the science of color exists is for, to, be, to make it possible for people to work with color in, in an understandable way. I always talk about balancing the intuitive color design with a rational color design because the intuition is great. We need, I mean, color is, it's passion, it's feelings, it's heart and everything. What my point is that one of the main reasons why people, although everybody knows that it's so important, why people avoid color is because they don't understand. Let me tell you an anecdote about my first meeting that you mentioned, OCMG in 2007 in Argentina, Buenos Aires. Right. Let me tell you an anecdote about that. I think it's a good, good, I usually tell this story because I love this story. I, I, it was my first meeting. I came then from NCS, from the scientific. I mean, I, I worked with a scientist behind the system. I worked with Anders Hort. I worked with Lars Seewig, you know. I had the privilege to, you know. The, and they, these people were geniuses. But they come from the reality. They come from the reality that, gosh, we have to make it possible for people to understand. So I did this. In 2007, I went to Buenos Aires for the first CMG meeting, the first CMG meeting for Latin America yeah. with Carol. And, you know, we were there and... You know, this is my first experience. Never forget about this. We sit in this workshop where people then, you know, supposed to stand up and say what they believe will be, you know, the trends for the coming years. And so here this, I don't remember his name, but it's an American guy who stood up and said, I think romantic colors will be very trendy in the next years. But and the thing is, this is a guy, uh, you know, that people trust. So everybody in the room, they were sitting there nodding. Yes, I think romantic colors is perfect. I mean, it's perfect. It fits perfectly. And I was sitting there and I, I was taking notes and I kind of raised my hand and I said, I'm just sorry. I, I just have to ask a question. I'm sorry. I come from a square-minded scientific institute. In those <laughs> days, it was called Scandinavian Color Institute. Okay. It was, you know, only science. And, and, and until then, Thomas Hard and, you know, the, the, all of us in the management, we have said color trend is we cannot work with it because there's no science. It's only fluff, you know. So anyway, so I come down and, and I raise my hand and I say, excuse me, I, I'm sorry, I, I might be stupid, but I don't understand what you're saying. What do you mean with romantic colors? Can you please? Because I, I don't understand that. And he began explaining with passion about romantic colors. You know, his vision about romantic colors. Mm -hmm. And suddenly there were other people raising their hands and said, no, 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 no. That's not a romantic color. I'm sorry. I disagree with you. And suddenly all the room was discussing about these romantic colors. And at the end, in the final palette, romantic colors were not even mentioned no. because nobody understood each other. And my point here is that many times, and I sit every time I sit in discussion, I just had this with Russia when I sat with architects and designers and with Russia, Zooming, trying to, to have a discussion about what colors we should choose the last with the facade of this building we're designing. And I said, you know, we have to stop here because we don't understand each other. The only thing that will happen is that you will decide the colors that I tell you because you don't understand what I want to say. So you have to stop. So we, we have to decide that we can use one language. We have to create this language in understanding how we should discuss color. I don't mind it, whatever, but we need to decide what language to use. So we speak the same language when we make color decisions, because every day that is the problem. Yeah. Every day. And I always tell the story about NCS. You know, you know, I'm an NCS passionate, you know. Yeah. The only reason why NCS was developed was when was a group of architects in the 1920s sitting around the table having this exact experience. Yeah. That we have to make color decisions every day and we don't understand what we're doing. That's still the and, case in many companies and many course. conversations we have. Yeah. So let's do let's go for white, you know. 
it's a safe decision. White is never a problem. It's yeah. okay. Or let's yeah, change our lovely. game and go for gray. You know, yeah, exactly. Away yeah. From white We're going to be bold. Be, yeah, be like, aggressive. Or, 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 you know, or, or like the automotive now. They launched this new electric cars. What is trend now? We're going to use gray, but it's going to be matte. <gasps> Matt Gray, that is so bold. And I said, come on, guys. What's the matter? This is where all you? automotive designers that are listening are just gonna go like, okay, next talk. <laughs> <laughs> no, the point here is obviously they did their job because that's what yeah. people want to buy. That's fine. Yeah. But when you look at that matte gray color in 10 years, it was said, you know, I mean, it's, it's a, you're killing, you kill, you know, take away all of the, I mean, there's no color. Yeah, there's no there light no reflection. There's, there's no, nothing. It doesn't reflect light. And I told the automotive industry, you have this, you know, golden opportunity, not being me, being, you know, a fundamentalist when it comes to color, obviously, but you have this golden opportunity. You're launching a complete new generation of cars, electrified cars. And when I buy electrified cars, I really want people to see that I, it's an electrified car. That you, you know, make that I, sustainable choice. Exactly. Yeah. It's sustainable. I invested a lot of money in it. And I want to show the world that it's electrified. Matte gray? No. no. <laughs> I want it to be seen. I want it to be perceived as this is something revolutionary, you know. So anyway, but that's, that's my personal thing, of course. Mm-hmm. Always has to go hand in hand on what, you know, what the market wants and what, you know, what they are requesting. Yeah. And also depends who you're speaking to, because if you're speaking to people like, let's say you're speaking in front of Color Marketing Group at one of our conferences and you talk about the intuition of color, let's say the beautiful part. And you speak indeed about romantic colors. So you talk mm. about colors that remind yourself of your holiday in Portofino. People will understand. But if you have an audience, which very often also still is my case of R&D engineers, people that maybe have to work on the physical color, mm. they're just going to be like, I don't know what she smoked this morning, but I'm not getting <laughs> what she's saying. You need that scientific part. You need you them. You need the design. Yeah, make exactly. Them understand what exactly. You're talking exactly. About without the so fluff. Well, yeah. No. Absolutely. And I mean, it's it's like I said. It doesn't have to be NCS. Yes, it can be any. But but we have to agree. You know, the science is fundamental. So we need to balance the intuition. The intuition is. I mean, at the end of the day, it's like all artists say. You know, if it's a good piece of art, you feel it. It's in your stomach. You can yeah. feel it. It connects. You know? It's that's the intuitive part. That's fantastic. The, the thing is, in the process, when we sit and I have to talk to people and we have to discuss things and to make the decisions, the rational part, the science, the understanding, knowledge of what we're doing. I think Werner Panton said it very well. You know, he said that to make color decisions has to be a conscious decision because colors always have a meaning and a function. When he says that, I think to me it means everything because I, I always talk about the aesthetics, the meaning and function of color because you have to understand the three dimensions. To be able to three to understand these dimensions, you have to understand the color you look at. Just one thing is you see a color and and you say, oh, that's a nice color. But the next step is what color am I looking at? How can I place that color in a context together with the other colors, you know, and understanding that I'm doing the right thing based on the knowledge I have. And so. also where are you going to apply or which country are you going to apply that color to? Because Ooh, you were of course. born and raised Swedish, you lived in Mexico for many years, then you lived in Brazil, United States, even Thailand, I, I saw. Mm. And now you also travel a lot when you can again to China and Russia. How have these experiences not only influenced your career, but how do these different countries look at color differently what has that taught you in in your experience oh it's but it's like you say it's one of the most important things i mean when you when you make design decisions you have to understand who you're designing for let me take russia as a good example and you know because the most recent example and for me because i haven't worked much in russia before and now when i have to discuss these things i mean so many things make sense because the reference points are different from our reference points I saw, I have, there's a scientific study from some of the universities of, you know, words, feelings, and colors, and how they differ. And a very good example of this is because you have different kind of of value words. You have, for example, warm and cold, that should be inherent definitions. You know, we are born, you you see fire, orange, you know, color, these are warm colors, and it should be the same for all of us on this planet. 
and it usually is. But in this study, and, and I raised and I and I said, you know, why is it like this? In Russia, it turns out that pink is considered to be much warmer than orange. Okay, okay. and the rest of the world is different. And they, they had another one which is very interesting. Also, uh, the the connection with the word false. They had pink and green. That was and it was outstanding. It was completely different from the rest of the world. And I said, you know, what is, but what has happened? This is the same in many of these countries, where especially when you've had a, a moment, like in China also, where you had a time, a longer period of time, where it was not possible or was not allowed mm -hmm. to work with design. Okay, your house was created exactly the same as all of the other houses. And then when, for example, in Russia, when the glasnost came, you know, everything exploded. Suddenly it was permitted to do things. So what happens in Russia, which is, I, I learned super interesting things. They said, you know, we cannot use so many chromatic colors because then people make reference to the tasteless 1990s when after the glasnost, because everything exploded and everything went so crazy. So if you use chromatic colors today, It takes you back that you know this is not good taste. This is bad taste. It's like right. it just went. It what became too much. And they want to move away from that. Exactly. So they have to be very careful what to do. So it it was very difficult for them or to to make convince them to actually take the step to work with color in the design yeah. because they they were scared. And the other thing they taught me about this, especially because I've seen this report about the pink and the green, for example, connected to false. And that was because in the Soviet Union, mm -hmm. they implemented this combination of, col of, of colors in most of the schools. So when you see pink and green together, people think about the Soviet Union schooling, which mm -hmm. is a terrible reference and it makes people feel bad. So you have to avoid these things, which is I mean, it, this is only Russia. Yeah, and that's color mm. psychology then, but then exactly. related only to one specific country or those who right. were influenced directly right. by the same regime. So so there, when you do the, I mean, as you know, when you do color design, you have to, first of all, who's the public? So is this product or is this, you know, something that would be used globally or only in one region? And then we have to understand what limitations are, what we have to be careful with, and what we should focus on. Yeah. So, and then it's like my dear friend, uh, Dr. Oberacher says, color is psychology. I mean, it's, 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 I was thinking Chevrolet or something, you know, color doesn't exist if there's not an observer. We are observers, right? If we, if we don't exist, then color doesn't, don't, doesn't exist, right? And, and color, so at the, at the moment you see a color, you will connect co that color to your world. You will connect to your meanings, your functions, you know, your aesthetics. And ma many times, and that's where the, the science comes in, which is fascinating, we have to understand what can be used for everybody and what cannot be used by it for everybody. What are good examples? What can be used for almost everybody? Uh, from research that I've read, it's, it's blue. Blue apparently is one of the most universally accepted colors, but then also which blue, because blue is a, you know, we, you. we both yeah. know that is like a huge selection. Yeah. But what, what would generally say that works for most regions in this world or most people? Well, the thing is, we're talking about different things, because if you talk, like we said before, you know, this research, we talk about inherent colors, like, for example, you know, the color of, of, of the sun or the sky or, you know, these are reference points that basically all of us have that give us similar feelings. Fire, I think, is one of the, you know, warm color is basically one of the only ones that we know we have feelings, this very similar feelings for. The other thing is that we know that there are two color areas that affect our central nervous system directly. And that is the very bright reddish, yellowish, you know, yellowish colors mm -hmm. that makes us more active. And like you mentioned, the blue ones, especially greenish blue colors that makes, you know, affects our central nervous system and makes us more, you know, calm. According to research, those are the really the only studies we know affect yeah. us in the same way. And then that's what I tell everybody, you know, we cannot talk about blues and reds. And it's like exactly your point is that's so important. Mm -hmm. We have to talk about what kind of blues and what kind of reds and what kind of bright colors. And I always say something that is very important also that people kind of, because when we talk about color, we tend to talk about blue colors or red colors and yellow colors. But many times the hue is not that important. 
many times the nuance is much more important. So when we talk about the central nervous system, we talk about very high chromatic colors. And it can be a very high, extremely high chromatic blue color also makes us nervous, you know. So the chromaticness in this case is much, much more, more, more relevant. But if you connect the chromatics in the high intense chromatic reddish, yellowish colors, it's like they make us completely crazy. You know, if you if you go to a room that is completely red, you lose your notion of time. You just, yeah. you don't understand time anymore because it, it you cannot, you just it can't handle you. it. Yeah. So, you know, I think one of the most studied colors today is red because it's also one of the colors that makes us react the easiest and the fastest. And then we can connect things to that. But red is, is uh, one of these colors that we know do things to all of us because of the intensity, because it makes us react. Yeah. Did you hear about the study from the Olympic Games in London? Did you hear about that? Yes. When they switched, when they manipulated the videos and they yeah. saw that the red team won more often. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's logical. You pay much more attention to red than we do to blue. Yeah, the woman right? in the famous red dress and <laughs> all the others dressed in, in black. I mean, yes, it is. Absolutely. It always uh, attracts the eye. Yeah. But besides that, it's, that's when, when it becomes more complex. That's why we work a lot with semantic studies to understand and to make graphs on you know, how different colors or opposites or value words affect different you know, groups of people. And that's why you teach color. That's why you speak to color professionals, design professionals all around the globe to make them understand all of these parts that they understand color and they know how to apply it correctly. Do you see differences among these students that you have around the globe how they interpret color differently, maybe yes, of the cultural background, but also because they have different interests in, in what to learn from the, the color uh, topic? That was a tricky question. That was a very tricky question. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, no. That's, but it's a good question. Um, I haven't thought about that. To be honest, one of the things that I think most of us realize when you travel very much mm -hmm. and you meet people for so many pe you know, places in the world, there, there are basic things that where we function exactly the same. It doesn't matter who you are, where you come from. I mean, we kind of function in, in the same way. And I, I, my experience is that color is one of these things because all of us, independently of who we are, we have relation to colors. And we believe that color is important. So in my experience, I see that people get the same kind of enthusiasm for learning color okay then there are certain cultures that are fostered or educated that color is an essential part of society like in india or or mexico for that sense yeah you know it's and people it's more allowed to do things with color and they it's can be crazy. more creative crazy yeah. or creative in doing yeah. things that maybe are not so expected you know you see patterns and you know they kind of you, you give them instructions and but they tend to go you know oh, I'll do these crazy things which is great and that's 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 more interesting yeah, yeah and so that's that, what oh, inspires the two of us being born you know me born being born Dutch I mean still on the northern part of Europe and you in Sweden that's what is so different from our culture that just when we go to these countries on business or, or just on holidays, we are overwhelmed and we feel so inspired, right? Yeah, no, absolutely. But I think that's one of the most, you know, most beautiful things about this. When you when you are able to travel around the planet to meet people and talk about color, you connect kind of the essence of, of the human mankind. That, that's that's why I think it's also so. It, what color trends? What attracted me so much about color trends? It is an analysis about the human mankind, yeah. the way we are, the way we think, the way we act, react to things. It's, a, I mean, you are, you need to analyze being that, is, you know, color is psychology. Then we have to understand the psychology of the world, of the planet, because that will drive our, you know, our moods will drive our preferences. Yeah. And besides, our sure. And besides the science, you know, the cyclic you know, movement of colors in the color space, what will affect our choice of colors finally is what will you know affect our psychology so when you when you do this and you you sit down and you try to understand the mass psychology of this planet is super interesting and it's never it, and it keeps on changing right so you never stop learning about all of this and you never no. stop learning about about cultures and people 
um, new generations, how they look at color, for example. Mm. Are there misperceptions about color? I mean, I've, I've come across a few misperceptions about color, but do you come across those traveling and, and working with so many different companies? And how do you take those people by their hands to maybe resolve these misperceptions? Sure. But I think one of the, one of the biggest misperceptions about color is what we are being taught about colors. Mm. You know, people teach us that certain colors mean things when they actually don't. I, I, usually, I usually say there is a huge difference between happy colors and colors that make you happy. Let's say that we want to use, you know, colors that make us happy. That doesn't mean that we should go for the traditional happy colors, you know, the bright reds or yellows, the constellation of these yeah. Because it, it, perhaps they will not make us happy it will make us just nervous. And, you know, you need to make the analysis, understanding what is actually colors that make you happy. And that's a completely different thing. And, and we, we are being taught, we have been taught so many things and we are being taught so many things that certain colors mean things when they actually don't. So we make a difference of, you know, certain colors we learn should mean things, but when we should actually focus on what they, you know, the actually what they should mean, you know. That's, How they make that, us feel. Like that's, again, that intuition oh, abso- part. Absolutely. Absolutely. The rest I mean, is all up here. Yeah. 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 But it's like, there's so many examples. We talked about the red color before, you know, and I read, it was a report that red used to be uh, a man color, you know, a male color. Does red feel male? You know, but people, that's what people would teach. I mean, it's, it's male because blood is, you know, all red and everything. And the yeah. men went power. to war and yeah. yeah, power when men went to war. And so red became very, you know, man color and everything. Oh, well, that's changed, I think. Yeah. No, no, of course it's changed, yeah. but what but I mean, that's... we have to do the job. And, and red is one of these colors, you know, I, I think one of the biggest misconceptions that make me laugh all the time is the red, the, the meaning of red here when you talk about a stock exchange. Because red, and it's true, I mean, it, and there are many examples of investors that have read the financial reports. And when then China says the curve is red and they go crazy, they get very nervous, that means it's crashing. But it's the opposite, because in the red curve in the stock exchange in China is something that is booming and in, in, in Europe is crashing. It doesn't mean that red color does this. It's just that somebody taught us that red should mean yep. this to us. Yeah. You know. And who knows who that was? But yeah, but interesting that you're talking about, about China, which obviously is seen as, let's say, a red, a red country also, it's always depicted as, as red, but it also has a very interesting history to the, the name of your brand, which is Mr. Carl. Because when you first started working in China, this is a little bit how this name came about, right? Can you talk a little bit about this? Because Yeah, love story. It's, it's a truth modification because it's actually a consequence of all my years working abroad. Because my name is Carl Johan Bertilsson, which in Swedish... I think it's a good, you know, a rhythm and, and everything. <laughs> it's not that difficult. But I mean, it, it, and it, when, I, when I was in Mexico, I would call people and say, this is Carl Jan Bartes. And I go, ah, can you spell that, please? <laughs> yes, I still get oh, that. Come yeah. on. So, so in, from Mexico, I decided I am Carl. Okay, Carl. That's it. Carl. Yeah. I mean, don't complicate it. So, uh, you know, everybody knew me as Carl. So when I've been working with NCS and, you know, when we had the same issues, so I, be- I continued using car. But the thing is that in many countries on this planet, they have problems and for some reason in using the first name with the, without the mister. Mm. Right. So I, I said, I'm car. Just call me Carl. OK. OK, Mr. Car. And, you know, and in China, it got so bad. And, you know, and the more I worked in China, the more I was, you know, because I am a brand ambassador with some brands there and I was on stage and I made movies and all the reference was to Mr. Carl. And I tried, I'm not Mr. Carl, I'm Carl only, please. Yeah. You resisted it in the beginning. Yeah. Yeah, I know. And I still do because Mr. Carl is really not a correct way of doing things. I'm not Mr. Carl, I'm Carl, period. But that's why when I formed the company, because I did that in the beginning, because in China was my main business. I said, okay, Mm -hmm. they know me as Mr. Carl, but I don't want to be Mr. Carl. I want to be Carl only, but let's keep that, but let's take away the A. Yeah. We have Mr. Carl, M-R-K-R-L instead. And let's make it, get a game of it. So, you know, yeah, try to pronounce M-R-K-R-L if you can. Mm -hmm. (laughs) 
and candy. <laughs> yeah, exactly. No, so that's that's the story why why I, I call my company MRKRL. I try to convince people that I'm Carl and not Mr. Carl, but it, it has become, and I'm partially guilty to it. I would call you Miss Judith. I mean, it's kind of a, yes. it's a rhetoric. Hi, Miss Judith, how are you? Good to see you. It is, yeah, but we do it, I guess, in more like a fun way. And But it's true that in some cultures, yes. I mean, I've been Judith Sun, because just Judith and then Judith Van Fleet for the Japanese was, mm. yeah, it was hard. But then they couldn't just say Judith because that's not polite in, in Japanese. So it would also be Judith-san, uh, where normally it would be Van Vliet-san, but that obviously was too complicated. So it was always Judith-san. Mm. So you have indeed been working many years in China, which I think for a lot of people is still this unknown territory compared to especially to Europe, but also to United States. What opportunities does, does it offer for you as also a design professional to to work with China and how is that so different from from Europe? I think one of the most fascinating things about China is that they have a very clear objective in in this world. I think everybody is aware of that. They want to be the world leading country. To be able to become the world leading country, they have to learn. I mean, it's a key issue for Chinese people is they have to learn because if they don't learn, they will. And I, I remember when I was the China China Expo in in Shanghai, uh, two thousand and ten, I think it was. I had the privilege to be invited to, together with Jotun Paints in those days, to the president of the China Expo. To and he he had a speech, a half hour speech about why the China Expo, or the, sorry, the World Expo, sorry, not the China Expo, the World Expo in Shanghai, why it was so important for China to have this. You know, and after he just talked for half an hour, but without any PPT or any pictures, he just talked, and everybody was sitting there just, wow. Because the agenda was so clear. China has been a superpower for 2000 years. We lost that 100 years ago. Now we have, you know, finalized an era that kind of made China end up 30, 40 years behind the rest of the world. We want to become leaders again. And to become leaders, we have to work very hard and we have to learn. And it was a very clear agenda. And, you know, and he talked about... That's what they're doing, right? They're learning. They're the best students in the world. And they're so ambitious and it's so pleasant to have Chinese students because, I mean, it's and for them, the teacher is everything. And when it, it's like I said to everybody, I tell everybody, you know, when I, when I feel, you know, depressed a little bit, I go to China because then you come back and you're happy again, you know, yeah. because they the, the people who can provide knowledge for Chinese people are masters. They are very important individuals and you know as, and i come from that background that's one of my biggest satisfactions yeah. so obviously if you combine that you have the combination of you know the fantastic attitude of learning to you know the appreciation to the passion of color and that we i can actually teach people about color if you combine those things it becomes so pleasant to work with these people yeah I can imagine. So, but it, I mean, it's China is not the only country in the world that has this. But I mean, this feeling, this enormous ambition and need and wish to learn, that's, that makes things so, so, so nice. Yeah. I've never traveled to China yet, but I've traveled indeed, just as you said, I've traveled a lot to, to Mexico, Colombia, Brazil, a bit of Argentina as well. And I, I felt similar reactions to when you do your color trends presentation or when you teach color to even those who are who are junior to you or maybe interns. Sure. They are sure. so spongy. They really want to absorb everything Absolutely. you know. And it's it's where I felt generally most appreciated doing yeah. my job. I mean, I, I I love doing my job. I love talking about color. Yeah. But it is indeed where maybe in Europe and North America, it's a little bit more matured. Yeah. I do feel that there, they are just like, wow, finally, you know, I get no. to sit in this class and listen Absolutely. to somebody yeah. from Europe, which also helps. I mean, mm. we are seen obviously as exotic um, to them and just learn from this person. Sure. Sure. Yeah. No, no, I, I absolutely agree with you. And I mean, Spanish, all of this, the Latin world is fascinating. I mean, I speak Spanish. So to me, it's like second home for me. And, and you're absolutely right to teach things in Latin America, to provide the knowledge, to have a speech about trends, about color is a fantastic experience. Yeah. I just had in Ecuador, oh, that two years ago in Ecuador, I had one of the most fantastic color trend sessions in my life, I know people were just so enthusiastic. It was beautiful, beautiful. 
So no, I, I don't think China is unique in that sense. What makes China unique is they're investing a lot of resources in this. Yeah. And it's top down, right? It's different. Mm-hmm. It's not, I think in Latin America, it's more the people that are creating opportunities for themselves because sure. they're not being offered easily. And in, in China, it is indeed, just as you said, it's what the government has laid out yeah. and you are going to adapt. Absolutely. Yeah. And people do. And, you know, and that's so it's easier from a sense, you know, from a commercial perspective. You have that passion, but and, and companies are prepared to pay for it. Where well, Latin America is more and more tricky. You know, you still, and I, I tell you, to be honest, I mean, I do speak Spanish. I feel very at home in the Latin American community. So if I could do that all the time, I would definitely do that most of my time in Latin America. Yeah. But the yeah. business opportunities are bigger right now in, in Asia when these expanding countries over there. So, you know, it's always the balance, you know. Yeah. What is the future of color? Where do you think color is moving towards in our future, five, 10 years, either further out? Well, I th- I, to be honest, I, I mean, we talked about this before. Um, we have been, I think Leah the Court talks about this also, you know, this period from 2001 until today has been kind of an anti-fashion period, which you know, we see people are very careful. You know, if you look at, the 19, you know, the post-war 1950s, it was an explosion. Everybody wanted to use color because it was like a compensation of this. And then, you know, after 9-11, a little bit, things stagnated. In, and so white, black and gray became like standards for everything. I think we are coming to an end to that period. And I see that already in, that, you know, because it's, it's this human thing. If you are, if you live in that kind of environment for too long, I mean, you, we will get tired of it eventually. So we, I do see already, and the discussions are wild now, how can we leave this? And it's a golden opportunity now with the pandemic. And I tell everybody, if you really think you should take next step now, it, it is perfect moment because after the pandemic and all research throughout history shows exactly the same. The human behavior after a pandemic is explosive. And we want to celebrate and we welcome and embrace, you know, fantastic color expressions. So I think it's a good moment if you want to break out of this neutral, grayscale, matte gray color thingy. Because I think color trends that we talk about, you and I a lot, it's, you know, every year they change because, but that's a more, you know, fast moving goods things. So when you talk about architecture and you talk about automotive, which is, you know, bigger investments, we are extremely conservative. But I would love the conservatism to welcome also that colors can be a part of that. And we have stopped that for many years now. And I think, to be honest, I, I already see that we are going in that direction. So yeah. I wish uh, for I, that I, too. I'm optimistic. You're optimistic. I'm optimistic too. I think this has been a huge learning curve for so many of us. The past year, the past, well, even this year still. And I have this, this although I'm optimistic, I do think this winter again, it's going to be a little bit tougher again to, to what we're looking towards in this summer. But I do think that people now have found a new way. And I think that new way is also connecting a little bit more to what they're feeling and what they're feeling, Mm. you know, within themselves. And to me, that automatically connects to bolder choices in life because we understand life can be very short. We only have so much time on this planet. We better do it well. Exactly. And once again, going back to one of your core questions about research and science, all research shows that if we have a choice to live in an environment that have a lot of different color impressions or in a monochromatic environment, the vast majority would prefer the colorful way. But the point here, you know, if research shows this and we understand that, I need us to allow it, to permit yeah. that to be a part of our lives. Yeah. If not, we'll be standing 100 years and say, you know, the 70s, 80s, 90s, and you know, 2000 or 2000s in the world would be like, oh gosh, what happened? Yeah, we'd what just be embarrassed think? about our what did color you history. Think? How did you think? Yeah. My gosh. They would keep these gray buildings and white buildings and say, look, this is the way they did. Yeah. 
what happened you know that's up to people like you and i right to to teach people about this to get the word out there to make people comfortable about making the correct color choices no matter what their industry is exactly and i think what in one of the core things i always say you know when i preach about color the use of color once again it's not that you have to use bright you know chroma high chromatic colors It's just that make it a conscious decision, understanding why you should use certain colors and that you use the right color in the right context. Uh, You just have to be a conscious decision and not like, ah, let's use gray, you know, because it's a non-decision most of the time. So, Mr. Mr. Carl, what is next for you? Uh, The next for me is that this pandemic ends and I can begin going because I really I, I really miss meeting people. I had this speech in China in December where we had an audience of 600,000 people at the same time listening. Okay? 600,000. That's a lot of people listening, architects and designers in China, which is great. I couldn't see one of them. I couldn't see any of them. There was no contact. I had no idea about the reactions. I had no idea what the feelings. I had no idea. Right. Looking at yourself back at the screen. It's horrible. Yeah. I mean you have to get used to it. But I I miss that so much that because that eye contact, you know, to look in the eyes of another person or the other people, seeing their reactions, understanding that this this is what they want much more than that. Mm-hmm. It's so, so important. And one, one of the things that I obviously, you know, because beyond the world will change now, people will not travel and meet so much anymore they mm-hmm. at home and Zoom instead. And I said, you know, I really hope it won't. Because if it does, we, if we stop meeting each other, the world will not be a happy place. So I, the next is the pandemic. I just have my two shots now. So ready to now go. I, yeah, I'm ready to go, but I just have to make sure that people are ready to receive me also. So. Yeah, indeed. No, I think that's the balance, right? I totally understand you. I think for especially in color, you need to be able to connect to people because they will energize you. And it's it's a give and take. Mm. But I do think that we are, as a species, we need to be together. That's oh, what we yeah. are. Yeah, yeah. And we need, and we are going through a very nationalistic era right now. And the, the more we stay at home, you know, the less we meet people, the more nationalistic we become. And uh, I, we need to get out of that bubble. We need to yeah. get out there and meet people again. So that's the next step. Yes. And I hope to see you somewhere out there. Yes. Oh, I'm very sure we will. Yes. Uh-huh. <laughs> this has been, I mean, we, as I said, I could talk to you for hours, but I want to thank you for your time, your insights, and uh, thank you for being part of the Color Authority. Ms. Judith, thank you so much for your time and for considering and inviting me. It was a pleasure and a privilege. I wish you all the best. So this was Judith Van Vliet from The Color Authority. Thank you for listening again to yet another episode. If you haven't done so, please go to Apple Podcasts, subscribe, review, and send us feedback on this episode. And I hope that you will be listening to the next episode coming out very, very soon. Thank you and have an amazing, colorful day.